Welcome to the Salt Systems Sustainable Aviation Podcast Series. The Salt Systems Northern Europe is delighted to have launched its first ever sustainable aviation student competition, and we are very keen to explore in this podcast series the challenge the student teams will focus on the future of propulsion. We will be speaking to experts in academia and the industry about their own vision to ensure the sustainability of flights and how the workforce of the future will help. Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Shanim Rahi at the Soul Systems and I will be your host today for this episode of our Sustainable Aviation podcast series. I am delighted to be exchanging with experts in the aerospace field to tell us what the future of aviation holds, how they see the future of propulsion developing, and what are the skills that will be needed the most by the workforce of the future. Today, I have the pleasure of welcoming Samir Savani, Head of Innovation Engineering at ADS Group. Samir has been a valuable member of ADS for 10 years and previously held roles in the Aerospace and Defense Knowledge Transfer Network and as a research scientist at DSOTL. He's considered by many an ambitious innovator and engineering leader. He is also an exceptional communicator that is recognized by industry and government as an expert, impartial and trusted voice in the aerospace and defense industries. So welcome, Samir. Thank you very much for being here with us today. Thank you for having me. A pleasure. Um, before we start with any questions, is there anything you'd like to say to the group that's listening? Um, yeah, so thank you for the opportunity to speak to you guys. Uh, I'll briefly introduce myself and then more than happy to answer the questions as laid out. Um, so I'm Samir Savani, uh, Head of Innovation and Engineering at ADS. For those who aren't aware, ADS is the UK National Industry Association for the Aerospace, Defence, Security and Space Industries. As an industry association, we represent around 1,100 companies uh, across those sectors, ranging from large primes like Airbus and Rolls-Royce that you'll obviously have heard of, as well as a whole range of smaller suppliers and manufacturers. My role as Head of Innovation and Engineering uh, means I sit within our aerospace sector team and I lead on a range of topics from technology and innovation, regulations, and environment and sustainability. And I guess it's that last one that brings me to this particular podcast. Um, I'd say the most exciting part of my role is around helping industry prepare for what's next. Uh, that might be from an emerging technology perspective, which is a really exciting area, and we'll go into a bit more detail later, or it could be through the lens of big societal drivers like climate change, future mobility, and of course, the here and now around post-COVID recovery and growth for the industry. Amazing. And it's exactly that expertise that we want to pick your brain on today. Um, so just as a quick start, what do you think are the biggest challenges that the aviation industry is facing today? And about that, do you think that COVID-19 has acted in a way as a catalyst of all these challenges that we had beforehand? Yes, yeah, so the answer to the last question is uh, a resounding yes. Um, <laughs> but I'll give a bit of uh, background as to why I think that is. So the immediate priority for the aerospace industry is, of course, recovery and growth from the global pandemic, right? Um, we kind of look at the global aviation market, about two thirds of the global aviation fleet was grounded at one point due to the crisis and the public's ability to fly and their confidence in flying uh, has been hugely impacted. So um, essentially aviation was placed in an induced coma. This had knock-on effects for the aerospace manufacturing and services sector. Uh, it resulted in slowdown or cessation of manufacturing right across the board. And that, of course, placed huge financial pressures on businesses of all sizes. Um, just a day or so ago, I was watching the BBC News in the evening. And one of our member companies, JJ Churchill, um, were, were reporting, uh, unfortunately, they had to cut 50 percent of their skilled workforce just to survive the immediate crisis period. And that's not untypical of what's happened in aerospace at the moment. So it's a really tricky time for the industry to recover from. It's an unprecedented downturn and which is obviously going to take several years to recover from. But if we look to the future, the fundamentals that make aviation such a success and what's been causing its um, growth over the past uh, several decades haven't really changed. You know, people still want to fly either for business reasons, for holidays, seeing families and friends right across the world. And for many of those desires, often flying is the only option. You know, other modes of transport simply don't get you there on time. Aviation is also a huge driver of economic growth around the world, so it enables commerce and tourism and even the delivery of humanitarian aid during times of crisis. It's just a few examples as to why aviation is so important and why we're confident that at some point we will see a strong recovery. I 
I guess before the pandemic, uh, climate change uh, really was high on the aerospace and aviation agenda uh, here in the UK. Um, we fully committed behind that decarbonisation target, and that was demonstrated by a commitment that the whole of the industry in the UK made in February just this year, and we committed to net zero carbon emissions by 2050 uh, for UK aviation. So it was a really unprecedented step globally for the UK to take a leadership position there. What the pause in aviation has done is certainly sharpened the focus on environmental impact. And following that industry commitment, we've seen the government launch its net zero ambitions. You know, that was mentioned by the prime minister himself. Um, one of the key organizations that funds aerospace research in the UK, Aerospace Technology Institute, launched a, a hugely ambitious Fly Zero program uh, to really point the way uh, to what a future sustainable aircraft and aviation systems looks like. So it's really clear. Whatever kind of growth trajectory aviation will see in the coming years, without doubt, it's going to have to be a green recovery. And in order to make that happen, we need both industry and government to really step up to that challenge. And we can do it. Industry is going to need to be more ambitious in the technology and other solutions it brings forward to step off that current trajectory we've got of incremental improvement and onto a new path towards net zero and zero emissions aircraft. This will be done through a range of solutions. Um, so I'll keep coming back to this point. There's no silver bullet. Um, that solves this. It includes a mix of hybrid, um, electric aircraft, use of sustainable aviation fuels, and other advancements like hydrogen power. So that's what industry can do, uh, but, but also government has a role to play in providing the right investment in these solutions, so ongoing and even more investment in R&T to bring those technologies forward, establishing the right policy frameworks to make the UK a world leader in sustainable aviation, and also using its net zero leadership, both from an industry and a governmental perspective, um, to influence other nations to follow suit. And a key point where that can happen is obviously the UK hosting the COP26 summit next year. Thank you very much. I 100% agree with you. I think COP26 presents an incredible opportunity for many industries, but I think for the aviation industry, most of all, in the, in the crucial time that we're experiencing. Yeah, absolutely. And I think we sometimes forget some key facts. You know, aviation isn't a particularly large polluter. It's about 2% of global man-made CO2, but it is growing and it's one of the hardest sectors to decarbonize. So in terms of its relative terms, in terms of its relative impact on climate change, it could well grow unless we do something strong about it. Indeed. So to touch on one of the points that you recently mentioned, so talking about sustainability and the Jet Zero Initiative, I am very much aware that ADS is in fact a key member of joining uh, industry and government to work together to achieve net zero emissions. Um, could you tell us more about the role that sustainable fuels are playing in decarbonizing the whole industry? Um, yeah, absolutely. So um, first of all, it's important to say that no one solution provides a silver bullet to aviation sustainability. So what the Jet Zero ambition that the Prime Minister laid out does, it kind of catalyzes the whole of UK aviation to come together to seek out what those solutions are. So Sustainable Aviation Decarbonization Roadmap that was published in February this year laid out a range of measures that need to be pursued to deliver that jet zero ambition. This includes advanced aerospace technology, um, as I mentioned before, hybrid and electric propulsion, uh, but also includes the commercialization and widespread adoption of sustainable aviation fuels and the acceleration of new energy sources like hydrogen. So uh, we're going to need a mix of all of these. Not any one of those is really going to provide that path towards net zero and deliver that jet zero ambition. So we need a range of those measures. And SAF is a great opportunity because it delivers here and now carbon savings while we await for some of those more advanced technologies, which may take several years to come to fruition. So in terms of SAF, we already have certified sustainable aviation fuel manufacturing pathways, and those can be used today. But typically, a sustainable aviation fuel that's available in the market today costs three or four times more than fossil jet fuels. So you can see why it hasn't scaled up and we haven't seen widespread adoption. The good news is uh, we are working closely with our colleagues in government to establish first of a kind fuel manufacturing plants right here in the UK. And that will enable the scale up of fuels, which means they will be far more affordable and probably much more comparatively priced to fossil jet fuel as we see it today. At the same time, it creates a new industry in the UK, which creates new jobs right across the country. And most importantly for me and most excitingly for me, it positions the UK as a world leader in this new green technology. So SAF is also a solution for the long term. So we need it here and now, and we need to see scale up today to really start decarbonizing. Um, we can already produce jet fuels from waste, for example. That's already been proven. But in future, we'll be able to synthesize aviation fuels, uh, perhaps even by capturing carbon from the atmosphere and using that to produce a purely synthetic 
fuel, something we call power to liquid. That's incredible. And really hearing you talk so passionately about it, it really kind of clarifies that we are entering this third era of aviation. There are so many advances in architecture, in thermodynamic efficiencies, in electric and hybrid electric propulsion, digitalization, um, artificial intelligence, and even like materials and manufacturing that the potential is. It's just incredible. And as you said, I think it's a very exciting time for the industry and, and for the world with climate change mitigation in mind. I'm very much aware that you mentioned that we need a mix of solutions to decarbonize the industry. But I, for more people who don't know enough about the future of propulsion in aviation, I was just wondering, where do you see the biggest innovation opportunities in this moment in time? Yeah, it's a really exciting time for the industry, as you, as you say, Shani. Um, lots of innovation happening right across the sector. I guess in that solutions mix, um, if we kind of break down some of the excitement, that'll be kind of a, a more coherent way of describing it. So we need a range of these solutions that we mentioned earlier to decarbonize um, existing aviation. So the typical kind of aircraft you and I fly on, short haul, um, long range aircraft, as well as allowing those technologies to create new modes of transport. So there is an opportunity to have sub-regional aviation, so much smaller aircraft flying shorter journeys, and that could be done all electrically. And even at the even smaller range, there's the uh, emergence of the urban air mobility sector or the so-called air taxis. So right across that range from really small aircraft, which could be all electric, all the way through to uh, long haul passenger jets, which will probably be powered by a sustainable aviation fuel to really decarbonize this innovations right across the piece. Um, If we take some of those shorter routes, we're seeing some great advances in battery technology and the associated electrification machinery and motor technology, the power electronics uh, that are taking place there. Really exciting. Lots of great UK technology being developed in that space. Those will, in some ways, always be limited by range because of the kind of energy density that batteries, even next generation batteries, will give you. Then you move on to um, what's called hybrid electric architectures. So that's using a traditional gas turbine that might be burning a sustainable fuel to really power an electric propulsion system. And that will get you a lot further in range uh, where there are limitations for full electric. And as we go into that kind of medium range, technologies like hydrogen come into play, where you could burn hydrogen within a gas turbine engine with actually quite little modification uh, to a gas turbine. And again, that provides a a really good decarbonization route. Um, What's particularly exciting and in some ways frustrating still for the industry is that the jury is still out in terms of how far in range those different technologies can take you, uh, which is why we really need that mix and which is why sustainable aviation fuels are so important because they play right across from short range all the way to the longest range aircraft. And then finally, you mentioned something like hydrogen. You know, this is a hugely exciting area where the UK could play a leadership role, um, a really exciting technology um, where you could use clean hydrogen in a number of ways. So at the small end, it could um, be used as a fuel source for a fuel cell to provide the electric power for those electric aircraft and those hybrid electric aircraft that we mentioned. Uh, and in future, it can be combusted within engines. And then really down, uh, you know, kind of 2035, 2040 range, it can be used as a source to create a purely synthetic fuel. So um, creating green carbon, creating green hydrogen, capturing carbon from waste gases or even from the atmosphere and combining that to create a purely synthetic fuel. So it's a really exciting time for industry. As we kind of develop those technologies and understand their capabilities, we also need to understand their boundaries. But what is clear is there will be a rich mix of different aircraft flying different ranges and different missions. And so all of these technologies interplay with each other and will come together in really interesting ways. So it's a really exciting time for aerospace and aviation. Great technologies to work on here and now uh, and great technologies coming over the horizon in the future, which will mean we'll be able to fly in a much more sustainable way and ultimately create great high tech jobs and great careers for people in the UK in the future. That's so encouraging. And that's exactly why we launched this sustainable aviation competition is because we want to open up the opportunity for students who are now entering the industry to have kind of their first chance of investigating what the future of propulsion holds. And that's exactly what they'll be able to do with the 3D experience platform at the Soul Systems. They'll be able to play with all these different technologies so they can focus on electrification or sustainable fuels or or really anything they want and simulate and design what we hope will be the aircraft of of the future. And actually, we're very excited to have you as a judge on this competition. Thank you very much for agreeing uh, to take part. We're very excited. (music) 
Uh, so I know that you studied an M- MCS on physics. And so I was just wondering, uh, thinking back on your times as a student and knowing everything you learned when you were studying physics and everything that you know now in, in your incredible position at ADS, what advice would you give, uh, not just to the students who are competing on this sustainable aviation competition, but also students who are willing to enter this complicated industry at the moment? Uh, yeah, first of all, um, for anyone who is looking to enter the industry, it's a fantastic industry and there's lots of kind of innovation going on, lots of exciting areas and the whole kind of climate change and sustainability en- agenda has really accelerated that need for technology, need for new thinking to come into this space uh, so we can fly sustainably in the future. So first of all, just a huge encouragement for anyone who is looking to enter the industry. I guess from my own learnings over the past uh, 10 years at ADS in particular, but harking back to um, some of my days at university, I guess the single biggest advice I can give to anyone entering the industry is around um, think at a systems level. Um, I kind of keep repeating the mantra that none of these technologies themselves will be the single solution. We need that technology mix to really find our way on this sustainable aviation pathway. Um, And none of these solutions are simple in their own right. Um, They're all incredibly complex as much as they are exciting. And so the trade-offs between them are just as important as the developments within those uh, individual technology areas. Um, So it's really important to kind of think in a systems way, how do these different technologies interact with each other? And think about the whole life cycle of these technologies to to make sure that those generations of technologies coming through are truly sustainable. A simple example, you know, there's a lot of talk about using aviation batteries at the moment, but we have to think about if we are gonna use batteries, um, are they charged using sustainable electricity? Um, Are the components and materials that go into those batteries sustainably sourced? You know, we think about some of the minerals and the metals that go into these batteries, lithium, cobalt. They're not necessarily the most sustainable uh, materials around. And then you have to think about kind of at the end of life, right? What happens to these batteries after their useful life? Are they reused in another sector, say in the automotive sector, uh, where cars need high-grade batteries as well? Are the materials recycled or do we dispose of these materials and batteries in a sustainable way? So any of those potential sustainability solutions really need to have that end-to-end complexity thought about. They need to have that kind of through life, um, that whole life cycle sustainability aspect thought about. So it's really important that you take the broadest of view when you're thinking about technology and you're proposing solutions. Um, So my advice is pretty simple, think systems. That's amazing advice for anyone who's entering the competition. And I 100% agree, I think, not just in, in this particular industry, but I think if we're thinking uh, in terms of sustainability and climate change, everything that we need to think about needs to bear in mind the end-to-end complexity of everything that we use. It's really interesting, Shama, that the, the, that the kind of design tools that your company develops gives you the opportunity to kind of play those trade-offs and to do those studies, even think about manufacturability, right? Because we're going to need to develop these technologies, but also then manufacture them at the appropriate rate for the market. So all of those design digital tools that you mentioned give us the capability and the capacity to do Precisely. And that's exactly what we're expecting of our teams. So that's why we're so excited um, that anyone listening to this podcast is considering joining us. And I think it presents an incredible opportunity as a learning development for the student themselves and for the industry, because I I predict that we will have some incredible results at the end of this competition. No, I'm very much looking forward to um, seeing the entries, judging the competition and um, hopefully being inspired myself to uh, what the future of the industry looks like. You can need both. I think it's a great opportunity for innovation, and I think we will be very impressed. Uh, Well, thank you, Samir, very much for joining us during this podcast today. Uh, It's been absolutely fantastic to have you. Thank you so much for all your your insights. It's been absolutely incredible. No problem at all. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much. Thank you for tuning in to our Sustainable Aviation podcast series. We hope you enjoyed this episode and that you follow the Salt System Sustainable Aviation Competition and register your teams. If you are a student registered in a university in the UK or Ireland and want an opportunity to change the world of aviation as we know it by designing a solution in the virtual world and the future of propulsion, for instance, related to the electrification of flights or alternative fuels, then come and join us in this competition. You have until the 11th of September 2020 to register your students or apprentices teams on our website. Just look for Sustainable Aviation Competition Dissolve Systems on Google or check out our Dissolve Systems LinkedIn page. Thank you very much.